Today, the image of the self-made entrepreneur fascinates us. However, for much of Western history, the entrepreneur was an unsung hero. We use and encounter the word entrepreneur constantly in our daily lives. They are seemingly an indispensable part of our modern economy. But the first person to seriously think about the role of the entrepreneur was the 18th century French-Irish economist Richard Cantillon in his essay on the nature of trade in general, published in 1755. But before this, for much of Western history, the aristocratic elite looked down upon merchants and moneymakers. A tradition stretching back to antiquity extolled the virtues of property ownership and farming. Of course, the aristocrats expected all the others to do the hard labor while they theorized how much better they were. But in the 18th century, things had started to change, dramatically. Compared to other European nations, Britain had led the way in a much more hands-off, laissez-faire approach to the economy, where regular people were given more freedom in how they acted. Because of this practice, Britain started to change. People became wealthier, and the aristocrats slowly had to accept the birth of what was called the middling orders, what we would call the middle class. Through spending their newfound wealth, the new members of the middling orders began a consumer revolution. And at the forefront of this revolution in the 18th century was Josiah Wedgwood, a man born the 11th child of a potter who ended his life as an esteemed industrialist, a tastemaker for English society, an advocate of enlightenment principles, and a scientist. In most aspects of his life, Wedgwood was a trailblazer. He is one of the great early examples of self-made entrepreneurs, but he did so much more than just create wealth in economic terms. With his newfound wealth, he built homes, schools, and improved the working conditions of his employees. Most famously, Wedgwood used his craft to advocate for the abolition of slavery, a cause near and dear to his heart. At a time when media pundits demonize the excessive wealth of entrepreneurs such as Elon Musk and Bill Gates, it is important to restate the crucial role entrepreneurism plays in our lives and how, when informed by humane and enlightened principles, can change the world in both economic and moral terms. Josiah Wedgwood was born on 12th of July, 1730, in Burslem, Staffordshire. He was the 11th and final child of Thomas and Mary Wedgwood. Wedgwood's father, Thomas, while not poor, was not particularly rich either. At the age of nine, Wedgwood's father died, leaving a promise to the young Josiah of £20 in inheritance money a promise that was never fulfilled. Throughout his childhood, Wedgwood worked as family's business. The previous thousand years of English history pointed towards Wedgwood being just another face in the common crowd. Wedgwood's father and his father's father had all been potters, just earning enough to survive. According to all conventional wisdom, Wedgwood would follow in his father's footsteps and earn a similar living, as most people did. After all, Staffordshire was hardly the cosmopolitan centre of the nation. Though there were many local potters in Staffordshire, potters only sold their wares locally. To sell to London was rare, to sell abroad was unheard of. By the end of Wedgwood's life, like many things, this would change. With his father dead, Wedgwood's mother took charge of educating her son in religious matters. She imparted on him a deep appreciation of the importance of curiosity and self-education. Wedgwood came from a family of English dissenters, Protestants who broke off from the state-supported Anglican Church to start their own religious establishments. Wedgwood and his family were Unitarians. They emphasized the importance of using reason to interpret scripture. For Unitarians, there is no conflict between science and religion. And because of this attitude, Unitarians defended the freedom of speech and conscience as indispensable rights for political and religious life. Where Unitarians verged most noticeably from the established Anglican Church was their view of original sin. Through criticizing scripture, Unitarians came to the conclusion that original sin was a falsehood and instead believed in the inherent goodness of man. Growing up, Wedgwood was taught that the world can be made a better place through human effort. Now, you might say, oh come on, doesn't like everyone believe that the earth would be better if we put in some effort? And the answer is actually surprisingly no. Few of our ancestors believed that there was such thing as progress. And it's actually quite hard to blame that, after all. Most people, including Wedgwood, worked the same job that their father had, with the exact same tools that have been used for hundreds of years, so it's kind of hard to imagine progress in that world. In fact, in the 18th century, many lamented the current state of the world and idealized the ancient Roman and Greek past as a more glorious epoch of human history. From a young age, Wedgwood showed great promises of Potter. But at the age of nine, after contracting smallpox, Wedgwood's knee was permanently weakened, meaning he could no longer use a foot pedal on a Potter's wheel. Despite his age, the young Wedgwood took this tragedy in his stride. He used this period of physical inactivity to read, research, and most importantly, experiment. His father and brother had made inexpensive, low-quality pots in black and mottled colors. 
While recovering from smallpox, Wedgwood saw the value of constant experimentation. Instead of making the same pots his family had always crafted, he dedicated himself to the idea of innovation. In his early 20s, Wedgwood worked as an apprentice under Thomas Wheeldon, one of the most renowned potters of his day in Staffordshire. By 1754, the pair became business partners. Wedgwood spent much of his spare time mastering the new science of chemistry to develop glazes and clays to improve his wares further. Wedgwood began to carry around what he called his experiment book, where he recorded the results from his numerous experiments. While working with Wheeldon, Wedgwood would develop a new green glaze that allowed for teapots to resemble cauliflowers. He actually designed them to look exactly like them with this new green glaze. And this kind of sounds like something you'd buy at a very odd second-hand store, but at the time, Wedgwood's cauliflower teapots struck a chord with the increasingly urbanised gentry that wanted to evoke their rural roots. For Wedgwood, yes, pottery was a practical affair, but it was also an artistic endeavour. After working with Wheeldon, at the age of 30, Wedgwood began his own business in Burslem, Staffordshire, his Ivy House factory. Thanks to England's vast colonial territories, tea and coffee were making their way to England in larger and larger quantities. The gentry and middling orders began to frequent coffee and tea houses to converse with their peers. This led to an increased demand for earthenware. But Wedgwood saw that it was not just teapots, mugs and saucers that people were after. It was about impressing your peers with sophisticated props. And in this emerging market, Wedgwood saw the potential not only for profit, but artistic renown. Elaborate, busy designs had fallen out of favour. What was demanded was pure simplicity of materials like porcelain. The issue was that porcelain was in short supply in Britain, and easily broke. Wedgwood began developing a cream glaze that would give earthenware the appearance of porcelain with none of the downsides. And after conducting over 5,000 painstaking tests, Wedgwood had perfected what came to be known as creamware. Wedgwood's craftsmanship was of the highest standards, but he was also renowned for his glazes that few could replicate. In 1664, Wedgwood would marry his third cousin, Sarah Wedgwood, a practice that seems very, very weird today, but was very common in Europe at the time. Originally, her father opposed the union, but after seeing the popularity of Wedgwood's glazes, he changed his mind. Increasingly known for his high-quality products, Wedgwood was invited to participate in a competition with all the potteries of Staffordshire to provide a tea service, or set, for Queen Charlotte. Wedgwood theorised that if he could get the Queen to use his wares, then all of the gentry would follow her example. Further down the line, then, the middle leg orders would begin to imitate their upper-class counterparts. So knowing this was a crucial opportunity, Wedgwood went all out, creating a creamware set using honey to help stick 22 karat gold to the pure white wares. Obviously, Wedgwood won the competition. Celebrating his victory, he asked Queen Charlotte to let him name his line of pottery that she had purchased, Queensware. Light years ahead of his contemporaries, Wedgwood saw the importance of distinguishing his brand and the importance of endorsements, and what better endorsement is there than a queen, especially for a tea set. All of Wedgwood's paperwork and stationery boasted this royal association, reading Queensware. For his efforts, Wedgwood was officially made the Queen's Potter. This title made Wedgwood a household name overnight, and quickly, the wealthy of Britain flocked to Staffordshire demanding a full set of Queensware. In 1762, on one of his frequent visits to Liverpool, Wedgwood encountered Thomas Bentley, a businessman from a wealthy landowning family. Compared to the self-made Wedgwood, Bentley moved in much more sophisticated circles. However, despite the differences, the pair became business partners and close friends. Though they came from different backgrounds, both men agreed that profit was not to be hoarded but used for the better of society. For example, Bentley had used his money to fund schools and fund the arts. By 1767, the pair partnered up, with Bentley focusing on decorative wares and Wedgwood focusing on domestic wares. Thanks to Bentley's familiarity with the aristocracy, Wedgwood began to develop a network of contacts to hone in on the aristocratic market, hoping it would filter down to the rest of society. Wedgwood and Bentley established showrooms in London to sell his wares. In the 18th century, stores were usually quite cramped and utilitarian, but Wedgwood saw how important display was to entice customers. Wedgwood was open with the intentions of his lavish showrooms. In his own words, they are to amuse, divert, and please, and astonish, nay, and even to ravish the ladies. Wedgwood also pioneered a range of services, including money-back guarantees, free delivery, illustrated catalogues, and even a rudimentary form of self-service. Wedgwood, more than any other entrepreneur in his day, focused on the retail experience and the comfort needs of his customers, not just the product. 
Wedgwin and Bentley established multiple showrooms throughout London. They were so popular they actually even caused some traffic jams with the big long winding lines outside. Seeing their success in London, Bentley and Wedgwood opened shows in Bath, Liverpool, Dublin and Westminster. In 1769, Wedgwood observed that vases were all the cry. The increase in demand led Wedgwood and Bentley to found a new factory in 1769 named Etruria after the Etruscans who inhabited ancient Italy. Here, Wedgwood dreamed of becoming Vase Maker General to the Universe, which is quite a cool title. Despite being after an ancient land though, Etruria was arguably at the time the most modern industrial space in the world. To minimise mistakes, Wedgwood had broken down the process of making earthenware into a series of smaller tasks. Like Adam Smith who came after him, Wedgwood saw the increase in productivity and the division of labour. As an employer, Wedgwood stood out as an enlightened example. He paid his employees well, but also built cottages for his workers around Etruria and even attempted to develop a form of air conditioning for his workers. Through his modernising practices, Wedgwood brought artistic perfection to an industrial scale. Though many of his popular products were initially purchased by the aristocracy, he eventually reduced the prices to appeal to a broader market. Wedgwood noticed that, in his words, a great price is at first necessary to make vases esteemed ornaments for palaces. But once aristocrats had already popularised his products, he would then reduce the price accordingly. For the first time, everyday people began to drink from mugs and decorate their home with vases of unparalleled quality and artistic design that gave a glimpse into the mindset of the British world. By Wedgwood's day, intricate designs, as I said, were out of fashion. Purity and simplicity was all the rage. At the same time, the newly unearthed ruins of Pompeii and Herculaneum triggered a European mania for all things to do with classical civilization. With artifacts being in short supply, Europeans wished for the next best thing, to imitate their classical forebearers. English push towards classism was not only an aesthetic choice, but a political one. The British intelligentsia had begun to theorise that Britain had taken up the position previously held by the Romans. Seeing this trend, Wedgwood began to develop a kind of vase that he called basalt that imitated the shape and colour of Greek and Etruscan vases, displaying yet again his unparalleled skill. Wedgwood had transformed the town of Staffordshire from a place that nearly always sold their goods locally to a locus of industry that supplied goods for the whole nation. But Wedgwood saw potential for even more growth abroad. Bentley and Wedgwood began sending sets abroad to aristocratic households, replicating Wedgwood's strategy in Britain. Wedgwood sent a gargantuan set of 952 pieces, each with original paintings, for a tea service to the Empress Catherine the Great. Wedgwood began to ship to Europe, but then rapidly expanded across the globe to places like Mexico, the United States, Turkey, and China. By the 1780s, Wedgwood was exporting nearly 80% of his total produce abroad. Though business was good, Wedgwood's smallpox-afflicted knee worsened, resulting in his leg being amputated and replaced with a wooden prosthetic. Though bedridden for a time, Wedgwood was restless and quickly resumed work, walking around a tree with his wooden leg, still throwing pots and experimenting. His employees eventually gave him the nickname Old Wooden Leg. In 1780, Wedgwood's close friend and business partner, Thomas Bentley, died. Wedgwood turned to his friend Erasmus Darwin as a new partner. Erasmus Darwin was the grandfather of Charles Darwin, and later on, Wedgwood's daughter would marry Erasmus's son. As Wedgwood shipped more goods abroad, he increasingly frequented London's port the largest slave trading port in the world at the time. Wedgwood was horrified by the whip-scarred bodies of enslaved people. Being a principled man, and in part to his Unitarian beliefs, Wedgwood abhorred slavery. Not only because it was immoral, but because according to Wedgwood, it was not befitting of the national character and the esteem that a Briton ought to hold. In 1787, at its inception, Wedgwood joined the Society for Effecting the Abolition of the Slave Trade. Wedgwood began to campaign against slavery by using his craft. Wedgwood mass-produced cameos of a black man in chains on his knees against a stark white background with the inscription beneath reading, Am I not a man and a brother? Wedgwood gave away these medallions free of charge for abolitionist groups. Wedgwood even sent some medallions over to Benjamin Franklin, who was then the president of the Pennsylvania Abolition Society. Benjamin Franklin really, really liked these medallions, and he praised them saying that their effectiveness is equal to that of the best written pamphlet in procuring the favour to those oppressed people. Gentlemen had this image inlaid on their snuff boxes and ladies wore it in their bracelets and hairpins. The emblem of abolition was unavoidable. It is arguable that Wedgwood's medallion was the most famous image of a black person in 18th century art. A friend of Wedgwood's and fellow abolitionist wrote of Wedgwood's medallions, the taste for wearing them became general and thus fashion, which usually confines itself to worthless things, 
was seen for once in the honorable office of promoting the cause of justice, humanity, and freedom. Wedgwood saw how fashion could be a vehicle for political change by providing an image that requires no words for explanation. His medallions perfectly captured the message of the abolitionist cause, and all of this 200 years before the advent of the t-shirt. That's pretty good. In 1784, the Duchess of Portland purchased what would later be named the Portland Vase, an ancient Roman cameo glaze from the first century. The vase was considered to be the peak of pottery because no one could imitate the cameo glaze. After the Duchess died in 1785, the Portland vase was auctioned off to William Cavendish Bentick, the third Duke of Portland. The Duke lent Wedgwood the Portland vase so he could attempt to copy the design. This was the most technically difficult endeavour Wedgwood ever undertook. The difficulties mainly arose from the fact that he was trying to imitate a glass surface using ceramics. But, through a lifetime of self-taught chemistry and determination, in 1790 he finally perfected his copy of the Portland vase. This copy immortalized his reputation as a master of his craft. But Wedgwood was not only a master craftsman, an industrialist, and an activist, he was also a scientist. Back in 1765, he had joined the Lunar Society of Birmingham, a group of industrialists, scientists, and philosophers who met during the full moon because the light made the journey at night easier. Members included people such as Joseph Priestley and Matthew Bolton. In 1783, Wedgwood was elected to the Royal Society of London for improving natural knowledge because he invented the pyrometer a device used to measure the high temperatures of kilns while firing pottery. After a life dedicated to his work and the betterment of the world, Wedgwood passed away on the 3rd of January, 1795, at the age of 64. Today, the name Wedgwood is synonymous with excellence in pottery, even hundreds of years after his death. Throughout Western history, aristocrats, nobles, and elites have always peddled the narrative that the way to achieve their status and prosperity was through familial ties and military prowess. But people like Wedgwood showed the model for the enlightened industrialist. Instead of relying on blood and family, he relied upon education. Though he was only schooled till the age of nine, Wedgwood was an autodidact. He spent his entire life learning and experimenting. And instead of military prowess resulting in looted goods, Wedgwood showed that the peaceful path to wealth was by fulfilling consumers' desires. Though a skilled artist, Wedgwood paid attention to what people wanted and filled the gap in the market. His marketing practices were years and years ahead of his time, and his penchant for building a distinct brand through advertising and quality was something genuinely unprecedented for an era where nobles still wore powdered wigs. Wedgwood used his wealth to benefit the world by treating his workers with dignity while advocating for humane causes like the abolition of slavery. Stories like Wedgwood counter the anti-capitalist narratives of the corrupting tendencies of private enterprise, showing that actually business can be humane, cosmopolitan, and most importantly, beautiful. Pottery is the art of turning wet mud into beauty, a process appreciated by a self-made man who himself had come from the mud. Thanks Mo for listening. Portraits of Liberty is produced by Landry Aries and written by me, Paul Meany. If you like the show, make sure to review us on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, wherever you listen to podcasts. If you want to see more content like this, check out the website libertarism.org.